So many years ago, I was invited to be the religious voice at a science conference, specifically a, a science conference on genetic technology and society, co-sponsored by Harvard University and, and MIT. The uh, occasion for this conference had been the, the cloning of Dolly the sheep, the first animal ever reproduced through genetic technology with an adult somatic cell. At the same time, the, the race was on to, to sequence the human genome, and, and speculation was, was just running rampant as to the, the possibilities of the future nature of human nature. Now, the students who were helping to put on this event invited me, I think, well, some of them went to my church, I think that's why they invited me, but others knew that, that I had served on ethics panels, they knew I had a PhD in psychology. I think they thought that, well, perhaps some theological and psychological perspective might be helpful in uh, navigating, navigating this terrain. What they didn't tell me was that I would be sharing the stage with uh, Nobel laureates in physics and chemistry, with uh, national science award winners in biology and genetics, with professors, with, with experts in every field of science, and then me, the minister. Ah. <clears throat> I got assigned to the, the panel on the ethics of human cloning, and thought I made what were appropriately cautionary remarks, drawing from my knowledge in, in uh, theology and, and psychology. I, I made a comparison to the Nicene Creed, which is an ancient uh, statement of belief that many churches have, have held over the centuries, in which a distinction is drawn between those beings that are begotten, that is, begotten, born of a mother through natural reproductive processes, sperm and egg, and that which we might make through other means, not involving a father. Well, anyway, as I was going on with this line of reasoning, the bioethicist uh, to my left was, was, was growing more and more agitated with my, my line of, of thinking to the point that eventually he angrily interrupted me to, to ask why was a religious voice allowed in a, in a conference devoted to the observation of material reality, to its, its replication, to its control, to its, its uh, scientific study and measurement. His uh, frustration was exacerbated, I think, when a student finally stepped up during the uh, Q&A time and asked me, the minister, what did I think? Would a human clone have a soul? I wasn't sure what to say. Whatever we mean by soul or, or mind or human consciousness, we know that it is a function of brain function. But we also know that our, our synapses and our, our brains can be influenced and, and shaped by external forces and by our environments. Indeed, this, this idea, this experience of human consciousness is one of the most confounding mysteries of modern biology. Move out from your mind to the universe itself, and you know, we used to think that the universe was eternal, that it had no beginning and no end, but then along came Albert Einstein and, and Edwin Hubble, the discovery that the universe was in, in fact expanding and at, at an accelerating rate, meaning that it had to have had a beginning, a, a beginning 13.8 billion years ago in what we have come to commonly call the Big Bang. But where did that material come from? How did it happen? What happened before that time when time began? This too remains a mystery of science. Of course, scientific mystery is not only about those things we, we don't know. There's a lot that we do know that is, is mysterious. For instance, quantum physics. We know that when it comes to quantum particles, to quarks, to those most elemental aspects of, of all matter and energy, we know that we do not know. We know that we cannot know both 
the velocity and location of any single particle at any point in time. And not only do we know that we cannot know it, but we know that this indeterminacy is a necessary aspect of physics and of reality. We also uh, are aware of, of these fundamental forces of, of the universe and of reality. We know that when it comes to electromagnetism and to the weak and strong nuclear force and to the, the nature of gravity and to the expansion rate of the universe, we know that the mathematical properties of these forces are, are so precise, so exact, so, some would say, fine-tuned that if you were to fudge them just the tiniest bit, well, we wouldn't be here talking about it because we wouldn't be here. Our existence relies upon this, this precision. Speaking of existence, we, we know that, that human beings evolved over uh, thousands, millions of, of years to become people like ourselves with, with amazing capacities, and that this evolution through natural selection and involved, uh, some would call, a genetic competition for reproductive advantage. But we as, as people exhibit incredible capacities for cooperation as well as for uh, competition. And we exhibit a willingness uh, to help others, a, a, an altruism where, whereby we will, we will come to the aid of a stranger to our own risk which provides and confers upon us no genetic advantage, no reproductive leg up. Of course, these, these mysteries are all summed up in the, the biggest mystery of all. You know, why is there something instead of nothing? Nature cannot create itself. Scientists and, and philosophers, philosophers of science who, who ponder these things will describe them as, as beautiful and wondrous, marvelous, and, and elegant. Yet at the same time, they'll, they'll talk about the processes that resulted in these realities as, as random and wasteful and purposeless. Random, the idea being that if, if you were to re-roll the cosmic dice, chances are we would end up with something totally different Again, the fact that we sit here and enjoy this day is just, is just dumb luck, blind chance. Wasteful in that the billions of years of cosmic life, the billions of years of organic life on earth has, has resulted in billions of stars expiring, species going extinct, an enormous amount of decay and death and error purposeless, and that to look at the universe, to, to look at life, to look at these processes and all that we enjoy is to see no in, inherent meaning, no obvious reason, no clear purpose. We just, we just are. But what if, what if we were to think about these processes from a different angle? What if instead of random, we, we thought about this, this in, terms, in terms not of, of, of randomness, but in terms of, of, of directionality, in terms of, in terms of freedom? What, what if nature as creation is, in, is endowed with a kind of freedom to, to become and to emerge as it will? Not that nature has a will or or a capacity to decide, but a free process creation has resulted in creatures like ourselves with freedom of will, the ability to choose and to decide. What if instead of, of wastefulness, we thought in terms of sacrifice? That the universe and humanity as we experience has come at immense and great cost, conferring upon us a value and a worth that we would not otherwise warrant. And what if the universe and all that we experience and know is, in fact, 
not purposeless, but instead, as we view it and, and see it, fruitful and directional. Like it or not, the trajectory of, of evolution has led from simplicity to complexity, from smaller to greater, from less to more, and ultimately to, to people with the unique capacities to, to love and to learn and to make beauty and to make music, to wonder and to worship. This is, is not something new. Turn, for instance, to the Hebrew Bible, centuries back where the writer of the eighth psalm stands and looks at the night sky and says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings? That you are mindful of us. Who are we that you care for us? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands and have put all things under their feet. Historically, much of the best of, of science has, has come from some of the best of theology, Copernicus and, and Kepler and Galileo and Isaac Newton. Augustine, Aquinas, Pascal, Sir Francis Bacon, and that's just, that's just Christianity. Charles Darwin, in every edition of Origin of the Species, on the cover matter, quotes Sir Francis Bacon, who, who argues that we must be proficient in both divinity and philosophy, in both faith and science, to make sense of all these things. Likewise, many Nobel laureates, National Science Award winners, Scientists like William Phillips and astronomer Jennifer Wiseman, Francis Collins, the, the director of the National Institutes of Health who sequenced that human genome, they likewise concur that we need both reason and revelation. Faith is reason plus revelation, and the revelation part requires one to think with the spirit as well as with the mind. You have to Hear the music, not just read the notes on the page. Thank you.